2022 is finally over! Thank fuck! And this year was really the first year I really tried to pay attention to more television because I figured I should pay some respect to some incredible stories presented on the small screen. I may not have gotten to all the shows I wanted to see like House of the Dragon, Severance, or The Boys, either because of busy schedules or... Yeah, just really, just some really fucking busy schedules. I hate life. But I did see enough to make my top 10 favorites of the year. Like I said, I didn't watch everything from this year, so my list is going to be wildly different from the rest of the pack. But for the ones I did see, let's pay tribute to them. Starting out with my honorable mentions, Moon Knight was definitely the best MCU show to come out this year with an amazing performance carrying a rather meandering story at times. Love, Death, and Robots Season 3 had some of the best highs of the series with episodes like Bad Traveling and of course Jabaro mixed with some of the most met episodes of the series. The Walking Dead actually had a pretty good final season even if it fell far from complete. And Spy Family was excellent in its first half and then sort of fell off a bit in its second. But overall was still really great. Anyways, on to the list ya geeks. Yeah, you're gonna see a lot of animated series on here, especially anime. I think this and last year showed me how important animation really is no matter where it comes from or who it's catered towards. And if there was one anime that received so much unbridled hype for a long time, it was Chainsaw Man. I've heard plenty of love surrounding the story for the past year and I was living in blissful ignorance of it until the anime finally premiered. And hell yeah, the show is great. It isn't perfect. Yet but it is good as shit. While some characters are sorta of left to dry for development, other characters are so distinct and have their own quirks that make them so insane and fun. The animation is absolutely stunning with only a few times where I noticed that the CG wasn't always finished, but only just a few times. The soundtrack is beyond good, like this may just be the best anime opening I've ever seen. Go watch Mother's Basement's video on it if you need any proof on that. And the story goes in multiple directions that I didn't see coming that made it so much fun to watch. Not once did the story feel like it slowed down nor felt rushed and it felt perfectly paced. What else can be said about the biggest anime of the year against a really stacked year? I still have a few that I liked a bit more from this year but I definitely understand the hype around it for sure. Also Aki is best girl, no doubt in my mind. I think. <laughs> what, what is that gnome doing with my daughter? Y'all may not know this about me, but I'm a nerd. I know, shocking. But another thing is that last year was when I really started to take D&D seriously. And in my venture to acquire the rank of Giga Nerd, I became a fan of Critical Role through their new series, The Legend of Vox Machina. This show was not on my radar at all when the year started. But through word of mouth, I watched the first three episodes and then I was immediately hooked onto this series. This show was just so much fun. From the comedy that really worked most of the time, to the animation that looked surprisingly good judging from the budget it was running on. The characters were all so fun to watch along with having the original Vox Machina voice cast coming in to play their respective roles from the original campaign, which is always awesome to see, and they were excellent. They all had their own insecurities and problems they had to deal with, and they all had some satisfying payoff to them. And that's great because I think the story is my biggest issue. It's very simple, and while it does give us some great character moments, the progression is fairly straightforward and predictable. But otherwise, this show is great for both fans of Critical Role's campaigns and newcomers like me. And Season 2 is starting to air more episodes, so I highly recommend watching this really fun series. In 2077, what makes someone a criminal? Getting caught. There were plenty of surprises for TV this year, and one of those was Cyberpunk Edge Runners. I'll admit that my gamer roots have softened over the years, and I'm only really playing games I really want to play, so I never got around to playing Cyberpunk 2077 despite how epic Keanu Silverhand Wick is. And judging from the reaction to that game, I wasn't missing out on much. So when I heard that not only were they making an animated series from this game, and that it was good, 
I had more than enough curiosity to check it out, and yeah, it's really great. I'm unfamiliar with Sue Trigger's other works, besides that one Star Wars Visions episode that had me dying because of how anime it truly was, so I had no idea what I was getting into. This is one of the most energetic and extra things I've ever seen in the best way. The animation is so chaotic and enjoyable to watch, and it also helps that the characters are just as fun too. I fell for all of them, especially the main character David, who wanted to feel special and make a name for himself only to realize that it's coming at the cost of his own body and spirit. I loved his relationship with other characters like Maine, Lucy, and Rebecca, who was actually best girl of the year, I lied, prank you idiot, and how they affected his life, and the story was mostly well told. I will say that this show was definitely begging for that 12 episode length, but only got 10 which makes the second half of the show feel a bit rushed or underdeveloped, like who the fuck is this Matt Mercer McCree descendant and why should I care for him this late into the game? Also, it does the whole damsel in distress trope for one of the characters that didn't really gel with me knowing how they carried themselves throughout the rest of the show. But regardless, the show is great and I will continue to worship Rebecca until the sun explodes, I don't care. Comedies are basically the most divisive genre to me, especially when it comes to TV shows. We've seen how bad a comedy show can be from just this alone, but to counter that piling weight, we got the rehearsal. Pretty much the most hilarious, thought-provoking, well-edited, well-timed, emotional, and warm prank I've ever seen. Despite this being a mockumentary-esque show, it not only takes its time with its jokes, making them more funny as the show goes along, but it takes its time to show how one's passion and drive could take up their life and make themselves believe in their lie they've created and it was just beautiful to watch. Nathan Fielder is so great at playing an embellished version of himself in both the comedic scenes and the honestly heartbreaking drama he puts himself in. And the episode The Fielder Method is absolutely one of the best episodes of television I've watched all year for the reason I've said before. The only nitpick I had watching is just some jokes not landing as well as others, but that comes with the territory for me. Overall, an excellent comedy series, and I hope Nathan is happy. I've been in this fight since I was six years old. Oh boy! It's time to talk about a Star War! It's no secret that this year was a massively divisive year for Star Wars television. The first half gave us two painfully mediocre series that relied too much on cheap fan service to make up for the forgettable tale they were telling. And in the case of Obi-Wan, felt like an elongated movie stretched out to meet the Disney Plus quota. So when they announced that Cassian Andor was getting his own series, I thought we'd finally run out of options for Star Wars. Like who the fuck cares about Cassian Andor for one of the most forgettable and disposable Star Wars movies? So I finally watched it and holy shit this show has no right being this good. While I still think the highs of The Mandalorian hold it a bit higher than the show, I think Andor is what Star Wars has been asking for for a while. An engaging adventure with multiple moving parts slowly coming together that build off one another, giving us characters with grey moral centers where simply being good or bad is almost non-existent, coupled with some of the best visuals, writing, performances, and direction of the entire series. Every storyline was intriguing, every character interesting, and every payoff satisfying. I will say that some of the pacing was a little off, mainly because I was watching week to week so some stretches of episodes felt more drawn out than others like 4 and 5, but damn did it have a great conclusion with episode 6. Overall, yeah, and or rocks, and I can't wait for season 2. But believe it or not, there was one other Star Wars show from this year I actually liked a bit better. Are you talking about Master Yoda? Yes. He is very legendary. Wait, what? Who? No, no, I'm talking about Master Yaddle. I will say Andor had a lot more to prove than Tales of the Jedi, but unlike some of Andor's episodes where some of the pacing sort of mucked up some of the story, this show doesn't have any of that. This series is friggin' phenomenal. 
Having the show focus on merely two different characters from the canon helped this show feel more focused, and it was also really smart to focus on the two characters that deserve to be expanded upon for different reasons. With Ahsoka, it gave us more of an opportunity to see how far she's progressed throughout her years and showed us moments that gave us more of an insight as to why she was fit to become a true hero. But with Count Dooku, it finally gave us a reason to care about him and show why the Jedi's philosophies and teachings are flawed and can cause ripple effects that would lead to his departure and their downfall. Seeing an organic change from rebellious hero to tragic villain was an absolute treat to see and having characters like Qui-Gon, Mace Windu, and Yaddle have an effect on who he becomes was so engaging to see. Along with the near flawless storytelling, the animation is as beautiful as ever, the action is really fluid, the designs are really great, and Kevin Kleiner continues to prove how powerful music can be in Star Wars with this show. I don't know how else to praise this show, it's just a near masterpiece. Yeah, it's more Clone Wars, but if it's still well done Star Wars, then I don't mind. You're doing great, Dave. We're rooting for you. Not only was he married, he had six wives. One of these Mormons, you know? If there's one show that can help elevate animation further beyond what people think it can do, it's Demon Slayer, and with season two, it somehow found a way to improve upon the already excellent first season in even the movie. The characters were more likable and fun here, the tension of each set piece was felt throughout, Tengen was a great new addition to the squad and was pretty epic, the villains were entertaining, and the action is just otherworldly good. And all this helped immensely by the animation, which just might be the best hand-drawn animation I've ever seen for an anime. I'll say that the formula of villains' backstories being revealed right before they die is starting to get a bit old and breaks up the pacing a bit too much, but even with that, I can't wait to see what happens next. And please let the next Hashira be Misery because I'm a simp with no shame. Well, do you mind telling us what's in it? Yeah, I remember. My dad told me before. Hey, Dad, what's in our basement? Oh, sure thing, son. It's called Go Read the Fucking Manga. This year, I finally got myself into Attack on Titan. I binged the whole show in about two to three weeks, give or take, and caught up in time to watch season four, part two, week to week has been an intense, gripping, and powerful blast to watch. Where season 1 had an intriguing setup, but very little time for us to sit down and actually care about the characters, here, at this point in the series, I'm super invested in both the story and the characters, since all of them have their own understandable motivations and goals, and have grown so much since their initial introductions. I found Eren to be the most interesting he's ever been in this part of the series, and he was honestly really terrifying. Other characters like Zeke, Mikasa, Jean, and especially Armin had to make intense and difficult choices leading to some very unexpected outcomes. And Flock was now taking Azula's place as the biggest I want death to reign upon you and everything you stand for character. <laughs> Fuck you! The animation looks incredible, even if I need some time to adjust to the new models and designs. I mean, shit, I'll take anything after what we saw in Season 2. And overall, this is one of those rare stories where I don't know what to expect going forward. I'm genuinely excited to see how this decade-long journey will end, and fingers crossed it doesn't throw a Game of Thrones ending at us like I'm fearing subconsciously. But so far, this is gearing up to become my favorite season of the series, and this show is gearing up to be one of my favorite things ever. But if I don't see Flop receive the Joffrey treatment next year, I will become Daenerys myself. Music! We need music! This is music! If there was one show from this year that had me on the edge of my seat immediately clicking next episode and watching till 4 o'clock in the morning just to see what the hell happens next, well, it would be my number one pick, but Stranger Things 4 was good too. Yeah, I love this show. Even in its weaker seasons, I was always intrigued by the mysteries at hand and all the characters were just so lovable that I still kept watching. And I'm so glad I did because season 4 might just be the best season so far. I was worried by its gargantuan run times for each episode that it would feel bloated and like they were wasting time, but almost every second really did matter for both the story and characters. Even side arcs that I wasn't always there for, like the Russian subplot, came back by the end in a fantastic 
artistic way. The production design and direction are the best they've ever been in this show, everyone's on the top of their game, and as usual, the integrations of many songs were spot on. You know the moments I'm talking about. The new characters are awesome, and the score is just euphoric. Hell, this season made me feel something for Max, who up until this season, I felt next to nothing for. But Han damn did she really improve here due to her actually having stakes in the story and still reeling from the events of the previous season and how that comes back to haunt her. It's just amazing. I honestly don't have much wrong with this season. I'm really happy the show is still going on and people are still giving it a chance despite the large gap between seasons. Here's hoping that the final season ends this saga beautifully. Don't promise Neverland this bitch please. As stated before, anime this year was fucking stacked, and majority of the ones I saw have been some of my favorite viewing experiences I've had all year. But even with the bombastic, intense, and action-packed animes I've watched, the one I consider to be my favorite of not just this year, but of all time, is Kaguya-sama Love is War. And season 3 is the best season, hands down. Simply put, no other show has ever made me laugh this hard with some of the most creative gags I've seen in a show before, but also made me this invested in a will-they-won't-they they relationship begging for them to finally tie the knot and get together. Because this show actually gives us time to show us why they would be perfect for each other in both the hilarious mind games moments and the soft dramatic moments too. The animation and direction help elevate every moment with such style and creativity that I think it improves on the manga it's based on. The voice acting is funny, especially Chica's VA having the time of her life. When you say puns, you aren't talking about my rhymes, right? Yes. You don't know the first thing about rap, do you, Fujiwara? Honestly, I thought if I just said yo to the stuff I say, it counts. The fucking rap episode is downright genius. Okay, I'll, I'll sell my arguments by saying Ishigami's best girl. Fine, I'll shut the fuck up now. I can agree. Sometimes you just feel safer having a strong companion to keep watch. And it's common sense that two people can conduct a broader investigation than one! So, so I, I propose? propose? I propose Ishigami and the president go scope this thing out together. I'm game. I honestly feel more chill when it's just us guys, and I wanted to see it anyway. Sounds great. Yes, splendid idea. And the final arc of this season was the most tense I've been watching a show this year. Deadass. It's just so flawless. This show is just near perfect and joins the ranks of Arcane and Avatar as one of my favorite shows of all time. But for now, I'm cool with settling this season at the top of this bullshit list. I, I don't know how else to describe it. It, 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 it. 